So I would like to introduce uh, professor, uh, Associate Professor, professor Daniel McDonald. Uh, he got his PhD uh, from the Australian National University in Canberra in 2001. Since then, he has worked as a research fellow at the ANU and as a research scientist at the Energy Research Centre in the Netherlands. Uh, currently, he's an Australian Research Council Future Fellow in the Research School of Engineering at ANU, uh, where, he is researching, where his research is focused on defects and impurities in crystalline silicon solar cells, solar-grade silicon and n-type silicon solar cells. So today's seminar will be on the uh, iron and crystalline silicon solar cells, fundamental properties, detection techniques, and gathering. So uh, please welcome Daniel, and um, I'm not sure if it's, it's going to be up to you if, or whether you want the people to interrupt uh, during the presentation with questions or you want to leave that till the end. It's completely up to you. How would you okay. prefer to do it? Oh, I'm, I'm happy for people to, to jump in with questions at any, any point. So just put your hand up if you have a question at some stage. That's, that's fine. And um, so what we'll, as you know, we have the room for an hour. So if I see that the questions are getting a little bit out of control, then I'll say, hey, Dan, can you continue? And okay. then we'll uh, finish off with time for questions then. So, welcome Dan, please. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ivan, and thanks for inviting me, Ivan and Alison. It's uh, really a, a pleasure to be here today at UNSW. So I'm going to be talking about um, work we've been doing over the last few years on uh, the impact of iron in crystalline silicon solar cells. And the, a lot of the results I'll be showing are, is work from some of my PhD students, and Yao Lu and Xu Peng Peng. So firstly, I'll, I'll give you a bit of an outline of what I'm going to talk about to create a bit of context. Uh, the first thing we'll look at is the origins of iron in multicrystalline silicon ingots, because iron is not really a problem in monocrystalline silicon, but it's definitely an issue in multicrystalline silicon, and we'll look at where it comes from in that material. Uh, secondly, I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about the, the different chemical states that iron can occur in, in crystalline silicon because this has a, a really significant impact on how that iron acts in terms of recombination. Uh, so I'll be also looking at the recombination activity of those different chemical states in P and N type silicon. And then I'd like to talk a bit about the techniques which we use to, to measure the iron concentration and the what I'll be talking about there is the interstitial iron concentration. This little I here symbolizes interstitial iron. So this means the iron is sitting in between the silicon atoms in the lattice. It's not taking the place of a silicon atom. And this is the most important form of iron in silicon. And many of you will be familiar with uh, the QSSPC, the quasi steady stat state photoconductance technique for measuring carrier lifetimes. We use that technique to measure the interstitial iron concentration in silicon very sensitively, so I'm going to introduce that to you as well. And an extension of that is to use photoluminescence imaging to actually create high resolution images of the dissolved iron concentration in silicon wafers. Uh, and finally, in the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about gettering of iron. And gettering, for those of you that don't know, is referring to the removal of iron from the bulk of the wafer and, and putting it somewhere where it has less impact on the device performance. So we have two types of gettering in principle. There's internal gettering of iron, and this is when the, the dissolved iron precipitates at grain boundaries or other crystal defects. Uh, and um, then we have external gettering of iron by surface diffusions, phosphorus, aluminium, or even boron diffusions can be very good at gettering iron. So they're the topics that I'm gonna try and tackle today. Firstly, the origins of iron in multicrystalline silicon ingots. This graph here shows the, the concentration of different uh, impurities in a multicrystalline silicon ingot. And you can see there's a, a class of impurities here which are substitutional diffusers and another class here which are interstitial diffusers. Uh, the substitutional diffusers move very slowly so it's not possible to remove them from the, the wafer bulk during a, a phosphorus diffusion gettering step. So you can see the blue and the green is before and after gettering. For the substitutional diffusers, there's no change. They, they simply don't move, so you can't remove them. But for the interstitial diffusers, uh, we see a, a large drop in the concentration of these metals after phosphorus gettering. And you can see that iron is the most common of those metals, um, both before and after gettering in this multicrystalline ingot. 
By the way, these measurements were performed using a nuclear technique called nu neutron activation analysis. So it's detecting the total ion concentration. It's not sensitive to different chemical states. <coughs> now it turns out that, that all of these impurities pretty much come from the, the crucible in which these ingots are grown. They don't come from the feedstock. The feedstock's very clean. It's coming from the crucible and the crucible lining. Um, and concentrations of iron in multicrystalline ingots are in the range between 10 to the 12 is typical today, whereas five or 10 years ago, the ingots were much more dirty. They were more like 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15. Okay, so then looking a bit in a bit more detail at the distribution of the iron in a multicrystalline ingot. Now this graph, it's a bit of a, a strange axis here. It's a fraction from the top of the ingot. So on the left hand side is the top of the ingot. On the right hand side is the bottom. Uh, it's shown in a log scale because then we can model the distribution of the impurities according to the segregation uh, law as a straight line. Um, and you can see that the, the total iron concentration increases towards the top of the ingot. And that's because the iron is uh, preferentially segregated into the liquid phase of the silicon because these ingots are solidified from the bottom to the top. The iron is much more soluble in liquid silicon than solid silicon. So as the crystallization front moves from the bottom to the top, the iron gets ejected into the liquid part of the ingot and the concentration in the liquid builds up and up. And that's why we see this increase towards the top. At the bottom there's also an increase and this is because after solidif solidification of the ingot the entire system is still very hot and iron can diffuse into the solid ingot from the crucible base and walls in the solid state. So we have contamination of the bottom of the ingot in the, in the solid state. Uh, and the other interesting thing to note here, th this data here is the total iron concentration measured by our nuclear technique. Down here we have the interstitial iron concentration, this is the dissolved iron, and it's much lower, it's two orders of magnitude lower. So this is telling us that the, the bulk of the iron is in some other chemical state, and most likely it's precipitated at grain boundaries and dislocations. Uh, so another important thing to note is even though the interstitial iron is maybe 1% or a few percent of the total iron, it still is responsible for most of the recombination in a multicrystalline silicon ingot in the as-grown state. After gettering, a lot of that iron is removed and it has less impact, but in the as-grown state, the dissolved fraction is causing most of the recombination events in these ingots. Okay, so a little bit more on the fundamental properties of iron in silicon. Uh, interstitial iron introduces a deep donor level in the silicon band gap. Here it is. It's quite close to mid-gap. Generally that means a strong recombination center. Um, it has two charge states. It's either neutral or positive. Uh, and in P-type silicon, it's usually positively charged. And that means it's very attractive for electrons, which are minority carriers in, in P-type silicon. So it's very good at capturing minority carriers, which causes a, a low lifetime in N-type silicon. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, these interstitial ion atoms are also mobile at room temperature. It seems surprising at first, but they actually do move around slowly at room temperature in the silicon lattice. And because they're positively charged, when they come near a negatively charged boron acceptor atom, they'll actually click together with coulombic attraction and form a pair, an iron boron pair. And these iron boron pairs have different energy levels in the band gap. There's one here, an acceptor level, and a donor level down here. This donor level doesn't do much in terms of recombination, but the acceptor level is a good recombination center. This diagram here shows a, a schematic of what an iron boron pair looks like in the silicon lattice. Uh, the other really interesting and important thing to know about these iron boron pairs is that you can easily break them by shining light on a sample. So the generating excess carriers causes recombination to occur through the iron boron pairs. The excess energy which is lost during that recombination event is enough to break the pair apart and cause the interstitial ion to drift off and become isolated from the boron atom again. Now this, this, the fact that you can toggle between these two states of isolated interstitial ion and ion boron pairs turns out to be extremely useful for a whole bunch of characterization techniques 
because, because these two states have different energy levels and different capture cross sections, they have a different impact on the carrier lifetime in silicon. And because we have a, a rough idea what those energy levels and capture cross sections are, we can actually estimate what their impact on the lifetime will be as a function of the injection level. And that's shown here on the left. This is the excess carrier density or the injection level. And this is the carrier lifetime. This is not measurements. These are, this is modeling results using the shockley reed hall uh, theory for recombination through defects. And you can see that interstitial iron has a very strong injection dependence. This is P-type silicon. Whereas the iron boron pairs are very flat. And this is really characteristic of iron in P-type silicon. And the other interesting thing is this point where they cross over, which we call the crossover point. This is really a, a signature of iron in P-type silicon. If you, if you measure a lifetime in a P-type wafer before and after shining light on the sample and you see that the curves change and they cross over at around 10 to the 14, you know you've got iron in your sample. Uh, on the right hand side is a typical measurement of a multicrystalline silicon wafer. This is after phosphorus scattering. So even after phosphorus scattering, we can still have enough iron to significantly impact the lifetime. You can see that before dissociation, so this is when the iron boron pairs are intact, we have a very flat curve. After we break the pairs, we get this strongly injection dependent curve. Uh, and you can see the crossover point here at around 10 to the 14. Now, this is, these measurements were done with the QSSPC technique, which is a very nice way of measuring lifetimes. But it is unfortunately affected by carrier trapping effects in multicrystalline silicon. And that's why we can't really measure much below 10 to the 14. So we can't really measure this part of the curves with the QSSPC technique. Now, as I said before, this toggling between isolated interstitial iron and iron boron pairs is the basis of a very nice characterization technique, which was first uh, uh, pointed out by Zoth and Bergholtz. And if you look at the shockley reed hall equations, I'm not going to go through all the maths here, but it, it's pretty easy to show that the interstitial iron concentration is actually proportional to the difference in the inverse lifetimes taken at the same injection level. So basically all that means is you need to measure the lifetime before and after breaking the pairs. And if you know the value of this C factor, you can calculate the absolute concentration of interstitial iron in your wafer. Very nice technique. The way that Zoth and Bergholz originally did it was with a, a method called surface photovoltage. So this is measuring the diffusion length rather than the, the carrier lifetime directly, but of course they're closely related. And that technique is not affected by carrier trapping and it works in really low injection, the true low injection levels down here. Not many people are using SPV these days for a, a bunch of reasons. It's not a particularly uh, easy to use technique and it has some restrictions on how high lifetimes you can measure. So subsequent to that, uh, the, tech, the idea of using this change in the lifetime by lifetime measurements was extended to microwave PCD measurements of the lifetime, and they generally operate in really high injection, and also QSSPC measurements, which is what we do a lot of at ANU for measuring the iron concentration. Um, these, way, these techniques of measuring iron are really sensitive. You can measure concentrations down to 10 to the 10 per cubic centimetre. That's actually better than deep level transient spectroscopy. Uh, but a disadvantage is it only works in P-type silicon because you have to have this pairing reaction with the acceptors. And the other point to note is wherever you're measuring, whether it's down here with SPV or up here, you, you can't do your measurement close to the crossover point, otherwise you, will be, um, you won't have very much sensitivity to the iron concentration. Okay, so I'm sorry I'm dwelling on this so much, but it's important for understanding what comes later. Uh, here's that equation again, the iron concentration. You need to know this C factor to get the absolute value. So this is quite important, determining this C factor. And it turns out that it, it has a quite strong dependence on the excess carrier density and on the doping concentration. But if you know the energy level and capture cross sections for interstitial iron and iron boron, you can calculate this C factor quite easily. And from that, you can then uh, determine the iron concentration. Now the thing to note here is when you're in true low injection, which is say, uh, you know, in this region here, the C 
factor becomes independent of injection level. It's, it's flat. And then it doesn't really matter what the absolute value of the injection level is. And so that's quite a nice regime to work in if you can because it's, it's a lot easier. You don't really need to, to calculate the C factor as a function of injection level. But unfortunately, we can't access that region with QSSPC because of trapping effects. Now, a lot of you will also know about PL imaging as a technique for imaging lifetimes. One of the very nice things about PL imaging is that it's not affected by trapping artifacts. Uh, so that means we can operate in the true low injection regime. We can, we can operate down here near this SPV technique. We don't have big problems with large variations in the C factor. And essentially by taking two PL images before and after breaking the iron boron pairs, we can use the same approach to, to generate an interstitial iron image of a silicon wafer. Uh, and be before I go on to, to show you some examples of that in multicrystalline wafers, I just wanted to touch uh, quickly on uh, another important aspect of iron in silicon, and that's the, the difference between N and P-type silicon. Um, as I said before, in P-type silicon, interstitial iron is positively charged, so it's very attractive for minority carriers. In N-type silicon, it's usually neutrally charged. So this means that it's actually not particularly attractive or repulsive for either carrier type. Uh, so as a result, it's, it's not strongly attractive for minority carriers. And um, as a consequence of that, we have a much higher lifetime in low or mid injection in N-type silicon than P-type silicon. And you can see that in this graph here. Here's the excess carry density, and here's the lifetime. These are lifetimes measured on two wafers, which have the, exactly the same amount of iron and the same doping, but one is N-type and one is P-type. And you can see that at low injection levels, there's you know, two orders of magnitude difference in the lifetime there. And this is really only because of the, the, different, the, the charge state of this defect in silicon. Uh, and again, on the right-hand side, this is the same sort of thing, but shown in a different way. Here we have the iron concentration and the effective lifetime caused by that iron concentration. So you can see that as the iron concentration exceeds around 10 to the 11, the lifetime in P-type silicon really crashes off pretty fast, whereas N-type stays high and is much more tolerant to, to iron. And so it's possible to use this as an argument for preferring n-type over p-type, but of course that's only true if metals like iron are actually a significant recombination centre in the material, and that's probably only the case for multicrystalline, not for monocrystalline. Okay, so now I'd like to move on to some iron images which we, we've taken using this iron boron splitting technique. We take an image with the PL imager before and after and we do the math, calculate the C factor, convert that into a an interstitial iron map, if you like. This is a, a multicrystalline wafer taken from about 20% of the distance from the bottom of the ingot. It's quite heavily contaminated with iron. The iron concentration, dissolved iron concentration, is 10 to the 13. That's about as high as you get in multicrystalline. Um, but the interesting features you can see here is that the grain boundaries are darker than the intragrain regions. So what that means is there's much less dissolved iron at the grain boundaries. It doesn't mean that there's less iron there. In fact, there's probably more iron at the grain boundaries, but it's not in the dissolved state. It's precipitated. So this is indicating that during the cooling of the ingot, the iron near the grain boundaries can move to those grain boundaries and precipitate. And as a result, we get a sort of internal gettering effect of iron near the grain boundaries. Not just near the grain boundaries though, but also around these dislocation clusters. They also are very effective internal gettering sites for, for dissolved iron during the cooling of the ingot. Uh, this is a wafer from very near the bottom, and you can tell it's near the very bottom because the grains are much smaller. Normally they wouldn't make a solar cell out of this wafer, it would be reused in the next ingot growth. But um, it's interesting to study. Uh, the iron concentration, the dissolved iron concentration is actually less in this case. It's around 10 to the 12, even though it's closer to the crucible, which is where the iron is coming from. And the reason for that is that we have smaller grains, we have more grain boundaries, we have a lot of intragrain defects like oxygen precipitates, and these are very effective precipitation sites. So the net result is that we actually have a lower dissolved iron concentration on average across the wafer. Uh, 
This is a wafer from the middle of an ingot, so this is more typical of what's used to make solar cells. Um, the iron concentration is low, around 10 to the 11. Um, you can still see some evidence of internal gettering to grain boundaries, but it's much less striking than in the high iron concentration wafer. And essentially the reason for that is because we have a lower iron concentration to start with, if you imagine the cooling of the ingot, the iron precipitation only really starts when the iron becomes supersaturated in the ingot. You have to have supersaturation conditions to drive precipitation. Now, if you have a lower iron concentration in your wafer, the temperature at which you reach supersaturation is lower. So there'll be less time, essentially, during the ingot cooling for the iron to diffuse around and precipitate at structural defects. So that's why we see a less strong contrast between the grains and the, the grain boundaries in the, in the central wafers. Okay, so we thought that was kind of neat and a nice way to produce very pretty pictures. But we wanted to take the analysis a bit further, so we decided to try and do some modelling of this precipitation of iron near grain boundaries. Now if you take a nice straight grain boundary and take the average along that grain boundary, then you can get fairly clean data. And here is the red squares here are the, the interstitial iron concentration as a function of the distance from the grain boundary. So this little hump in the middle is the grain boundary. And you can see this nice smooth uh, pro iron profile near the, the grain boundary, which extends around about one millimetre or so. Um, and we found that we could fit this profile with a very simple one-dimensional diffusion and capture model. So what I mean by that is the only things which we simulate in the model are the, the thermal diffusion of iron and we assume some parameters for how likely it is that an iron atom will be captured at the grain boundary when it reaches it. So we actually only have two free parameters, the diffusion length of the iron and something which we call the precipitation velocity of the grain boundary. And you can think of this as exactly like the surface recombination velocity for free carriers in a wafer. Uh, it's, it's the same analogy, but instead of a free carrier, we now have an iron atom diffusing towards a grain boundary. This parameter determines how likely it is to precipitate there rather than just sort of bounce off and, and diffuse back through the crystal. And well, we didn't particularly expect it to work very well, but it turned out that we could fit the data quite well with this simple model. And, uh, and I'll show you some more results from that in a moment. We, we found that the grain boundaries generally don't act as infinite sinks for iron. If you, if you treat the precipitation velocity as an infinite velocity, then you should get something like this blue data here. But we, we never see that in practice. So we think that most grain boundaries are not acting as infinite sinks during precipitation, but as somewhere in between. Um, now I should note a couple of words of warning when trying to do these experiments. We had a pretty tough time getting this to work because although PL imaging is a fantastic and powerful tool, it's also subject to some measurement artifacts which can cause problems, especially when you're looking at large changes over small areas, as we're doing here. And one of the main problems is um, you have image smearing in the CCD camera. So in, in our tool, which is from BT Imaging, the, the, the detector is actually made out of a silicon wafer. So it's not very good at absorbing the infrared photons that are being emitted from the wafer. As a result, those photons can actually get bounce around in the detector and be absorbed in a different pixel to the one which they entered the detector in. And this causes sort of blurring of the image. Um, but it's, it turns out, and we did this in collaboration with Torsten Trupke, that it's possible to define something called a point spread function, where you just have a, a tiny point source of light and you image that. And from that you can determine the, the extent of this smearing effect. And then you can deconvolve your PL images to sort of reverse that smearing effect. So we found that that's quite important for, for trying to uh, get good measurements like this one. The other thing that often affects things is uh, the carrier spreading in the sample. So what I mean here is the diffusion of minority carriers within the sample causes uh, a further blurring of the image. And this one's more difficult to avoid 
and essentially it means that you're limited to using uh, samples with low diffusion lengths or high, high ion concentrations. So that's what we've done. How am I going for time? Is there a clock somewhere? Okay, I better speed up. <laughs> All right. um, okay, so just a little bit more on this. Uh, these, these are three different wafers. Um, sorry, yeah, three different wafers, but with this, their sister wafers, so they have the same grain boundary in them, but they had different uh, starting iron concentrations. And we found that the, the diffusion length of iron, or the width of this denuded zone, seems to be a function of the initial iron concentration, even though the grain boundary is the same, so it should have the same precipitation properties. And uh, I was talking a little bit about this before. We think that there's a, a good explanation for that, and that is that when you have a higher on, higher on con iron concentration, the precipitation starts earlier during the cooling of the ingot because you reach the solubility limit at a higher temperature. Whereas when you have a lower iron concentration, you have to wait for a longer time until precipitation begins. So you, you have less chance for the iron to precipitate at the grain boundary. Now this, data, this plot here is a little bit hard to understand. Sorry, I'll try and explain it. This is the initial iron concentration in the wafer. So these four circles represent the modelled uh, width of that denuded region, if you like, um, as a function. And this is the iron diffusion length, which we've extracted from that modelling. And if you assume that the iron starts precipitating as soon as you hit the solubility limit of iron, and we know what the solubility limit of iron is in silicon, then you can't explain our results at all. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, they should be right up here somewhere. This tau t equals 12 hours is the, the characteristic cooling time of the ingot. That's probably what, similar to what was occurring during the ingot that we're measuring. It should be right up here. But our data's way down here. And the only way you can really explain that is if you say, if you require a high degree of supersaturation of the iron before precipitation begins. And in fact, you can estimate that. We, we think that you actually require a supersaturation ratio of about 50 in order to start precipitation at the grain boundaries. It's not something which happens as soon as you reach the solubility limit. Uh, okay, I'll go over this one quickly. Um, so what I've shown so far is precipitation at the grain boundaries during ingot cooling. You can also take a wafer and then anneal it at a, a fixed temperature for given times to study things a bit more precisely. This is an as-cut multi-crystalline wafer, the iron image. If you take that wafer and anneal it at 600 degrees for a couple of hours, you can see the denuded zones get wider. And also you can see that the iron concentration in the grains goes down as well. Uh, if you then take this wafer and anneal it at 900 degrees for one hour, you actually have the reverse effect. You have a sort of homogenization of the iron concentration. And that's because um, you're no longer driving precipitation because the temperature is high enough to be above the solubility limit and the iron is very mobile at that temperature. So you're essentially just spreading the iron evenly throughout the wafer and not driving precipitation because of the high temperature. So this is just shown again here and as a cross section. Uh, these curves here, the, uh, the green one is the as-cut sample. So this denuded zone here or this drop in the iron concentration has occurred during ingot cooling. If you then anneal it at 900 or 1000 degrees, you homogenize the iron concentration completely. This little spike here we think is a measurement artifact, so don't pay too much attention to that. If you take this wafer and anneal it at 600 degrees, you see the iron concentration in the grains drop as well as the width of the denuded zone increase. So you have precipitation at the grain boundaries and you also have precipitation within the grains. Um, Whereas at 800 degrees, not much happens. And that's because you're at the sweet spot between driving precipitation and um, redistributing iron. And so the, the net result is that the, the profile doesn't change much. So if we apply our simple 1D uh, model to, to these profiles, this is after 500 degree annealing for various times on the same grain boundary. Um, firstly, we did a high temperature anneal to homogenize. And then after 30 minutes and increasing times, you can see the, the width of this denuded zone increase and the, the concentration within the grains decrease as well. And it turns out that 
because we know the temperature and time, we actually know what the diffusion length of iron should be. And that's the, the red line and the blue ones are our measured diffusion lengths of iron from the modelling to the um, denuded zone. And they agree very nicely. So perhaps this is a, a good way to actually measure diffusivity of, of metals in silicon at relatively low temperatures. Okay, one more thing on this before I move on. Um, we've also found that when you do a long time anneal at low temperature, 500 degrees for 14 hours, we don't see the same reduction in iron concentration across the wafer. This is what it looked like after homogenization at 900 degrees. But then we see after 14 hours, some grains still have a relatively high iron concentration, whereas others are much lower. And uh, you can see that here in this plot. This is the cumulative annealing time, and this is a, on a log scale, the iron concentration. These are different regions or within different grains in the sample. The, the characteristic time of precipitation within those grains, so I want to stress here I'm talking about precipitation within the grains now, not at the grain boundaries, uh, varies a lot uh, by a factor of, of four. We didn't expect that, um, but we found out that a possible explanation for that is the different grains have different dislocation densities in them. And you can see that in this optical image of a wafer which has had a, a defect etch applied to it. Some grains have more dislocations than others. And we found there's quite a good correlation between the dislocation density and the interstitial iron concentration remaining after a certain period of time at a certain temperature. So, we think that the dislocations are actually acting as nucleation sites for precipitation of iron within the grains. Okay, so that's all I've got about internal gettering of iron. Um, now I'd like to talk a bit more about external gettering of iron. Uh, this is really more important in terms of device performance because this is the, the process by which we really reduce the interstitial iron concentration to a low enough level that it, it doesn't actually have much impact on a, on a typical multicrystalline solar cell. But for these studies, we haven't used multicrystalline wafers. We've used monocrystalline wafers just because then we can be certain that we don't have other impurities present as well. It's just a, a cleaner experiment if you use monocrystalline and you deliberately introduce iron at the surface. We do this with implantation. Uh, so another advantage of implantation is you really know how much iron you put in there precisely. Then we anneal the samples to distribute the iron uniformly throughout the wafer. Uh, and then we do our gettering step, whether it's phosphorus, boron, or an aluminium diffusion. And then after that, we, we chemically etch the diffused region, passivate the wafer, and measure the lifetime and before and after breaking the pairs. In this case, we do it with QSSPC because we're, having, we're using mono wafers, so there's no real lateral variation. And from that, we can calculate the efficiency of these different processes at removing iron from a wafer. So that's what is shown in this graph. I'll take a couple of moments to explain it. Here we have different phosphorus diffusion steps. So a phosphorus diffusion at 850 degrees, 800, 750, and this one is a phosphorus diffusion at 850, followed by a, another low temperature anneal at 650 for a, a few hours. Um, this, so in the literature, you can find papers about this. It helps to improve the efficiency of certain types of cells. It's called extended annealing or precipitation annealing, some people call it. Um, and on, the, on this axis, we have the percentage of interstitial iron remaining after the gettering step. So if it was 100%, it would mean that we hadn't removed anything. We have no gettering efficiency at all. It's, it's, it's not creating any gettering. 10% uh, means that we've removed 90% of the iron from the wafer. 1% uh, means we've removed 99%. That's good gettering. Uh, and you can see that a higher temperature phosphorus diffusion is not as effective as lower temperatures. And there's actually a good reason for that. And it's based on the fact that Phosphorus gettering of iron um, is driven by the fact that iron is much more soluble in the phosphorus diffused layer than in the wafer itself. So there you have this different uh, solubility and that's what drives the iron to move into the, or to stay in the diffused region. Uh, at higher temperatures, the difference between those solubilities is not as great. Uh, 
as you go to lower temperatures, the difference between the solubilities gets larger and larger. So you actually have a stronger driver for gettering at lower temperatures. On the flip side, at lower temperatures, the iron moves more slowly. So you have to do it for longer. So low temperatures is more effective gettering in principle, based on the segregation, but it takes longer to actually get good gettering. Uh, and that's the reason why if you then anneal your sample at 650 degrees, the iron concentration drops again by another order of magnitude. That's essentially because of this much greater difference in, in solubility limit between the base and the diffused region at the lower temperature. But you have to do it for several hours to give the iron a chance to reach the surface. Okay, so um, we've also looked at the effect of, of driving in the phosphorus diffusion on the, on the gettering efficiency. So here are some ECV profiles. This is the phosphorus concentration as a function of depth. They all have fairly similar sheet resistances, these diffusions. So the total amount of phosphorus in these diffusions is not varying very much. But what varies a lot is their depth and the surface concentration. And without going into the details here of the different models, if you just look at the measured data, which is red, um, essentially as you move along here, you go to higher drive-in temperatures, which means a deeper diffusion with a lower surface concentration. And you can see that the, the fraction of iron remaining actually increases. So we're, we're having less effective gettering when we drive in the phosphorus diffusion. And, and, and we think, or we, we're quite certain, that that's caused by the fact that the phosphorus gettering is predominantly happening in this very near surface region where the concentration is really high, above 10 to the 20. And if you don't have that very high concentration of phosphorus at the surface, you, you won't have as good gettering of metal impurities. Of course, the trade-off to that is that that high surface concentration is not as good for surface recombination. So there's a, there's a sort of um, a trade-off there. Okay, so that's phosphorus gettering. Um, looking at aluminium gettering of iron, if you look in the literature, there's, you quite often read about the importance of aluminium gettering for improving multicrystalline cells. But this always seemed kind of strange to us because the, the process by which aluminium is diffused into a multi-wafer to create the back surface field is only lasting for a few seconds at 750 degrees or so. So this is not really long enough to allow the iron in the wafer to reach this back surface gettering region. So we never really believed it and we wanted to do some experiments to, to check it out. Um, so these, these hashed curves here are for aluminium gettering. Um, aluminium at 850 degrees for 55 minutes. This is a long time. You would never do that in a solar cell. But we wanted to make sure we gave the iron enough time to move around. And when you do that, the aluminium gettering is really good. It's much better than phosphorus, uh, even without a uh, low temperature anneal afterwards. In fact, these are pretty much at the detection limit. We're, we're below 10 to the 10, around 10 to the 9 of iron. We couldn't really measure it much lower than that. And even um, at 750 degrees, it's, it's excellent as well. But if you only do it for 15 seconds, which is typical, in fact, that's probably a bit more than what's usually used for firing an aluminium BSF in an industrial solar cell, we only removed about 30% of the iron. And when you model the diffusion of iron under those uh, conditions, this is the, the simulated iron concentration from the back of the cell, if you like, where the aluminium is. We're only extracting um, iron you know, for, for 30, 40, 50 microns. Beyond that, the iron just doesn't have time to reach the rear side. So, I think it's a bit of a myth that aluminium gettering is important for multicrystalline cells. It, really, the gettering action is going on at the front side with the phosphorus diffusion. Okay, we've also done some work recently on boron gettering of iron, and our motivation for this is uh, quite simple. We're, we're interested in making n-type multicrystalline cells because we know that n-type silicon, in principle, is more tolerant of metal impurities than p-type. Now, it doesn't, that doesn't really have much of an impact on monocrystalline wafers because there aren't many metals in them anyway. But in multicrystalline material, there's a lot of metals. So it may make sense to use n-type rather than p-type. Um, not, not many people in industry are interested in this for various reasons, but I mean, we still think that in principle it, it 
it is interesting. Uh, but the flip side is you no longer have a phosphorus diffusion on the front, you'll now have a boron diffusion and so you will require your boron diffusion to do very good gettering if you want to make an efficient n-type multicell. And uh, so these three curves, here, these three data points here are for boron gettering. We found that a boron diffusion at 950 degrees uh, gives excellent gettering. It's as good as aluminium. It, we, it was down to the detection limit again. But there's an important caveat on that. You have to have this region called the boron rich layer, the BRL. It's shown here, it's this, um, it's sort of like a boron silicon alloy, which is in between the silicon substrate and the borosilicate glass on top. You don't always have this during a boron diffusion. If you, if you do an oxidation in situ at the end of your boron diffusion, you can uh, oxidize out this boron rich layer. It goes away. And if you do that, if you do the same boron diffusion and then you oxidize out the BRL at the end of the step, all of the iron comes out of the BRL and gets injected straight back into your wafer and you're back to where you started. So um, it's, it's really important for boron gettering to have this BRL layer intact during the, the boron diffusion. Um, now the problem is, of course, that um, this boron rich layer is very difficult to passivate. You can't passivate it actually, so that's why people usually oxidize it out. Uh, if you have a BRL present on your wafer, uh, you will get a, a saturation current density of around 1,000 femtoamps. This is no good for high efficiency cells. You won't get more than 610 millivolts or so with that, maybe a bit more, but not much more. So th this is not, it's not possible to have a BRL on a high efficiency device. So we've also looked at removing the BRL at low temperature by putting the samples into nitric acid uh, to remove the BRL and the metal impurities which are embedded in it without oxidizing it out at high temperature which causes the iron to be re-injected. That, that's not bad, it, your J0 is now about 100 femtoamps. You can probably get 650, 660 millivolts with that. You won't get 700 millivolts. Um, if you remove the BRL by thermal oxidation, which is what's usually done, then you can get very low J0 values. Uh, which are compatible with high efficiency cells. So at the moment there's a bit of a, a, an impasse here between requiring the BRL to get good efficiency but having to remove the BRL to get good surface passivation. Now I'm going to skip over that one and just go straight to my conclusions. Um, so I, I think that I've probably convinced you that, that iron is a common impurity in multicrystalline wafers. It's present in dissolved and precipitated form. Um, the dissolved ion is more active in p-type than n-type due to the, the different charge states, and this is a, a fundamental property of ion in silicon. Uh, we can measure the ion concentration, the dissolved ion concentration with QSSPC, and also with PL imaging. Uh, and that's very interesting for studying internal gettering at grain boundaries. Um, I've shown you, I think, that the gettering of the iron is, is really important for multicrystalline cells. We have some internal gettering at grain boundaries and dislocations, but this is not actually that important for getting good devices. The, the really important gettering is the external gettering, which is coming usually for industrial multicells from the phosphorus diffusion. But we've found that aluminium and boron are in principle more effective at gettering than phosphorus diffusions, but that when you have a boron diffusion, you only get very good gettering when you have this boron rich layer, which is not compatible with good surface passivation. And at the moment, we're trying to figure out ways to get around that uh, conundrum. So uh, that's, uh, that's all I've got for you today. Uh, thanks very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Alison. Thanks, Dan, for the talk. With um, the ways of removing the boron rich layer, so you had two, the boiling nitric acid, and uh -huh. the second one where you actually did a thermal oxidation afterwards. Right. Wouldn't the thermal oxidation be very similar to doing the dragon? Yeah, yeah, you're right. That, that would be bad in terms of the gettering. It would re-inject the iron, but I just included it there to point out that that gives a better quality surface in terms of passivation. But so, the but the bulk is degraded, yeah.
And, and with the boiling nitric acid, did you have to do a number of cycles, nitric acid, HF? Because the nitric acid would, is basically oxidising it. Yeah. But then you have to remove that oxid, oxide because your boron rich layer was, what, 70, was it 70 nanometers? It was quite thick. Yeah, oh, well, um, I don't think it was quite that thick, but 17. 17 or, yeah. So that would take a while to oxidise with nitric acid. So did you have to do a number of cycles of nitric acid HF to... I think when, when the BRL was thicker, we had to do a number of cycles. But I think in some cases when it was very thin, one cycle removed some of it at least and improved the, the surface passivation. But yeah, I think in general you would require a number of cycles. Yeah. My question was the same. I didn't oh, okay. understand what that, the, the first and the third step in removing the BRL, why they were different. But oh, sorry, yeah. I, okay, no worries, David. Yeah? With the aluminium jettering, was that uh, evaporated aluminium or screen print bases? That's evaporated aluminium. Very thin, it's 70 nanometers. You, you don't need much. Um, but I think uh, screen printed paste should behave pretty similarly in terms of gettering. Yes, Ivan? You mentioned that uh, it would be interesting to go into N type polycrystalline silicon yeah. silicon. Could you expand a little bit more, more on that and, and why you think then the industry is not interested in this very much? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not our main research theme. It's just something we're continuing to work on. But um, I guess in industry, um, the problems with N-type are you get a larger distribution of resistivity in the ingot because of the segregation coefficient of phosphorus. So this is a problem in practice. You end up with a, an order of magnitude variation in resistivity rather than just a factor of two or three with boron. Um, and otherwise, I think it just hasn't been demonstrated that there's an advantage for n-type multicrystalline at the cell level compared to p-type. It hasn't really been shown yet. And th that's maybe partly reflecting the fact that until quite recently, um, the cell architecture is quite limiting itself. So even if you had better quality material in multicrystalline, it, it may not have actually resulted in a very large improvement in cell performance. Mm. Uh, the, the work on looking at the iron near the grain boundaries was really uh, very interesting, okay. but, but um, analysing the PL from a region like that would be a bit of a nightmare. I think you've got a spatially varying lifetime and an injection level dependent lifetime. So it, um, yeah, it's really very complicated working out what's going to come out from yeah. the region. Yeah, so in, we, you're right, it is, it's not easy. <laughs> um, in terms of the injection level dependence, that actually turns out not to be such a problem because with the PL imager you can operate in true low injection. And there, in principle, the lifetime, even though the injection level is different near the grain boundary, in principle, uh, it's not injection level dependent. Even for the dissociated state? Even for the dissociated state, yeah. Once you go, um, once you go very low, I'll go back up here. You have to go really low in injection level. But maybe here. Even in the dissociated state, if you get down to 10 to the 13, below 10 to the 13 for one ohm centimetre p-type material, it's kind of okay. Mm. But, but the other point you made about the spatial. the spatial variation of the lifetime, this is a problem as well because you have different extents of carrier diffusion across pixels. So that really limits us to measuring samples with low lifetimes, where the diffusion length is not much larger than the pixel size. Yeah, so it, it is, there are some really major limitations that you have to be aware of. Yeah, you've got some nice data from, from the techniques, so it's obviously working well. It seems to work okay. The, the diffusion lengths which we extract for the iron agree with the literature, so that gives some confidence that it's not too far off. Yeah. Mark? Um, what process do you use for making and breaking the um, boron iron pairs? Okay, so you, do, you can just do it with illumination and um, usually we use the, the flash from the QSSPC. This is working pretty well. If you just take all the, the filters off and just 
blast your sample with that 10 or 20 times, that usually does the job pretty well without heating it up too much. Using a steady state lamp with one sun is not so good because unless you have active cooling, because if your sample heats up to 60 degrees or so, you'll actually have the repairing, you'll, you'll drive the reverse reaction. Thank them for this great presentation. Alison's oh, got another one. Oh, sorry. Um, so, so the observation, on, I'm, I'm not sure I'll give it right, um, but if, that your precipitation rate at the grain boundaries is faster if it's um, super saturated in mm -hmm. the grains. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. in a way it's not that surprising because if you think about what happens in solution chemistry, that's yeah. exactly what happens like growing crystal gardens. If you right, exactly. super saturate the solution, the crystals grow faster, don't they? Uh -huh. so, so it's quite similar to solution based. Yeah, I guess it is. Um, we probably need to read some textbooks on that. <laughs> and yeah, I, our, our initial naive picture was that as soon as we hit the solubility limit, precipitation would start to happen. And maybe it does, but it's extremely slow. And it's only when you have a significant amount of supersaturation that it speeds up enough that you can actually yeah. detect it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Mark? Um, are there efforts in the industry to avoid iron getting into the ingot in the first place? Yeah, yeah, there, there have been a lot. Um, there's been a lot of improvement in the, in the quality of multi-ingots over the last five years. I mean, we we've probably been measuring iron concentrations in multi-wafers for about 10 years now and we've seen the average iron concentration in central wafers drop from 10 to the 13 down to 10 to the 11, 10 to the 10 and that's because people are using cleaner crucibles and cleaner crucible linings and they're growing bigger ingots as well so you have a bigger volume to surface ratio that really helps too and I think that's going to continue to improve further so I mean multi-material can still get better. Yeah. 10 to the 11, is iron still a, an issue? or Not, not after phosphorus gettering. If, if you apply phosphorus gettering, even without the extended annealing, you can drop that by another order of magnitude. And if you're down at 10 to the 10, that's not having a significant effect on the cell. Martin? So after a phosphorus gettering, you know, I can't remember your diffusion links for the iron, but it was you know like 300 microns or something. You'd have a gradient of iron towards the rear of the device, so that might improve the effectiveness of even a 15 second gettering step. If most of the iron is at the back and that's where it's getting gettered from. Do you mean with the aluminium? Yeah, with the aluminium getting. Okay. Sorry, yeah. um, so your diffusion links, you know, like I guess the iron would be distributed across the wafer. It would be, yeah. 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 So Depending on what those diffusion links were, so you'd have a pile up of, a, of iron at the rear. So therefore, if it was only get it from that with the aluminium, it could be still quite effective, even if you're only getting 30% for a uniformly distributed iron. Yeah, that's true. I guess we didn't think about the possibility of having a, a non-uniform I guess you can work it out from your diffusion links for the iron that you measure at the ground boundary, so just how it would be distributed right. across the way. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, within, within the grains, the iron concentration is pretty much uniform from front to back. Is it or, or would it be, have the same type of diffusion link as you measure at the grain boundary? No, it would be quite different to the grain boundaries, so yeah, yeah. That's a good point, we can think about that. Thank you very much, Dan. Okay, you're welcome.